Concept number one, this is the building blocks of society. So number one, anti-fragility. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And for anti-fragility, our prop is gonna be our one-armed Mexican mate. One of history's greatest mustache wearers, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, is famous for saying a lot of great stuff, but arguably the most famous, he said, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. This is anti-fragility. Nassim Taleb coined the, the phrase anti-fragile and expanded on this concept of Nietzsche, what doesn't kill me make me stronger, through his analysis of, of, of anti-fragility, defining it as things that gain from disorder. So it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. You gain from the disorder. So things that are fragile break from disorder. Do you know how we lost that arm? Things that are robust, like this table, for instance, it takes a lot more disorder for them to break. But if you put it outside in the rain, if you stand on it, if you toss it off a building, maybe tossing it off a building will break it. But it's quite robust to disorder, but it's never going to improve from the disorder. Whereas Carlos is fragile and that's why he broke at the slightest disorder. So things that are anti-fragile improve from disorder. So anti-fragility loves disorder. What is something that's anti-fragile? The human muscles on the body are anti-fragile. So your bicep is anti-fragile. So every time it's stressed and you're doing a bicep curl, or quite frankly, you're just doing anything that's using the muscle, the muscle actually strengthens on the other side. Because initially, the stress that you impose on the muscle sort of you know, tears the fibers and in the short term hurts it, weakens it but it heals back stronger. So the disorder actually makes it better. Human beings are very anti-fragile. Your muscles are very anti-fragile. A really important caveat in this one, because this is one of the longer descriptions, trust me, most of them are much shorter than this, but an important caveat for uh, understanding anti-fragility is the stressor threshold. So basically, if if I get down and I try and lift the car, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurt my back. Okay, not just my back. I'm going to hurt a lot of my body. Basically, I've exceeded whatever the stressor threshold was. Okay, so anything can break if you apply enough stress. The point of anti-fragility is recognizing your stressor threshold and then just testing it so you never break fully, but you always improve from the disorder gain. So when you go to the gym, you're incrementally lifting more and more weights as time goes on. And that's because you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Your stressor threshold is improving. So the absolutely amazing thing, the brilliant thing about anti-fragility is that as you continue to stress the threshold, the bar is continually set higher and it's making you stronger and stronger. So I'll leave it for you. Can you think of an example of something that is anti-fragile? Well, in case you couldn't, I got three three lined up for you, three, three barrels here. Children are anti-fragile, okay? So allowing a child to play and stress their environment actually causes them to experience failure, uncertainty, and unfairness. Children are anti-fragile. As long as their stress threshold is not tested, for example, playing with snakes or hitting each other or hitting each other with baseball bats or whatever, then the child will actually adapt according to the real world conditions. So the child gains from disorder. Children are anti-fragile. A surfer who has experienced many unpredictable swells is going to fare much better in stressful surf conditions than a more experienced surfer, a better surfer, uh, will fare. Because the better surfer, his experience is in much calmer, less volatile swells. He's improving as a surfer, but he is more fragile to the dangers of a bad swell than the less uh, technically uh, gifted surfer, but someone who has experienced many bad swells, okay? So in this case, the, less, the, the worse a surfer is actually more anti-fragile to this specific stressor, okay? So the stressors can be specific. You can be anti-fragile in some areas and completely fragile in others. So yes, I'm sorry that it's a long one to start with. I think that actually is the longest of all 31. Uh, perhaps there is something strategic to be said about doing the longest one at the beginning of the video. I'm sure people will agree it wasn't the smartest idea, but however, it's out of the way. They get a lot more succinct from here. And also just to round this one off, you'll have seen uh, the little information bar come up up top. I have actually made an entire video about anti-fragile. So if that didn't quite cut it for you, please visit. Like, subscribe, five stars. All right, number two, we've got cumulative error and a little uh, Shinto shrine is our prop for this one. So the cumulative error, uh, otherwise known as, more commonly known as, or recognized as the, smo the snowball effect, okay? Or even perhaps the domino effect. But basically once an error at the top is made, if it goes unnoticed, it will only serve to be further propagated by its continual reprint, okay? So if 
x is assigned the wrong value at the beginning of the equation, then your outcome is only going to get worse and worse the deeper you go and the more iterations you have. In our era of interconnectedness and constant immediate attention, I would surmise that cumulative error actually ends up being responsible for so much of the fake news that we see. Okay, so imagine if you're Imagine, imagine the cumulative error of one unqualified journalist's publication. He publishes that the truest, most purest form of combating the coronavirus is by drinking two liters of Coke a day through your left nostril, okay? So he's proven that it works. It gets reprinted because uh, in our era of interconnectedness and constant media attention, we're rarely reading beyond the headline or beyond the, the punchline. And so actually it might inadvertently be picked up by a bigger publication, therefore giving this obviously nonsense opinion a little bit of credibility. All right, number three, we've got the Matthew principle and our prop here is Australia's finest, the boomerang. Okay, so the Matthew principle, uh, it's very intuitively easy to understand. Okay, so the principle basically explains the old saying that the rich get richer. Okay, so opportunity breeds opportunity, success breeds success. The Matthew Principle is not confined simply to wealth and the money markets. It uh, really is applicable to any competitive domain. You start somewhere, each additional rung of success you get actually gives you access to a fork of more opportunities of success. If we're all starting from here, my first success, you know, will give me the fork of, of two more options of success and then each additional success forks out. So in any competitive domain, success will breed success. It's the Matthew principle. So winning once exposes you to more opportunities than you or anyone else had before the initial win. The effect is then continually compounded to the point where a great majority of the domain is occupied by a winning minority, which we'll speak about later in the Pareto principle, Jordan Peterson's favorite. PewDiePie has, at this time of recording, 104 million subscribers, making him the biggest YouTuber on the planet. Sorry, too serious. Not sorry. He uploads almost daily, and by his standards, a video is bad if it doesn't get up to 5 million views. What's the point? He can make content about almost anything and experience success from it, whereas a significantly smaller channel could make videos equivalent in topic but superior in quality and actually never experience any success. PewDiePie's previous success breeds new success. He is reaping the rewards of being at the tippity top of the Matthew principle. Okay, number four, we've got cultural parasitism and our prop is this um, beautiful handmade, actually Norwegian uh, fishing knife. So this actually wasn't so clear to me when I first read about it. A parasite thrives to the detriment of its host. Okay, so a leech is a parasite. It gains from your detriment. Its health bar goes up while your health bar goes down. And how does this relate to cultural parasitism? The least barrier to resistance ideology is the parasite for cultural parasitism. These ideologies corrupt the host's mind to transfer and spread the ideology. Bear with me. Think about the anti-vax crowd. And also think about, on along similar domains, the Flat Earth Movement. There are obviously many factors that go into explaining these phenomenon but cultural parasitism is certainly one of the more formidable. The ideology's health bar goes up to the detriment of the host. If there is someone who just harps on and on and on to you about Flat Earth, they become less and less credible. Uh, it's a complete win-lose relationship between the cultural ideology and the host. So a bad idea has this cultural parasitism to it. I hope that made sense. Okay, number five is belief bias. And our prop for this video is um, some Japanese plastic food. There's a beautiful bowl of ramen. Individuals are more likely to rely on prior knowledge and personal beliefs than newly found evidence and facts. Okay, so this is perhaps for some a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow. However, need not worry, we're actually all um, exponents of this, of this concept. It takes an exceptional person to actually forego their beliefs in the face of new evidence, but I'll continue. So we're more likely to accept conclusions as true because they are believable rather than accept them because they are logically valid. Contradicting our personal narrative is a very difficult task to undertake. All belief systems, pri primarily those faith-based, exploit an individual's belief bias as part of a credence with that group. Looking at the belief bias offers us an explanation for why two completely different people, an atheist and a Christian, 
can be presented with the exact same facts and come away with two completely contrary conclusions. I'm not making a statement whether one of them is right or wrong, but rather it's highlighting the power of the belief bias. Both of these groups were presented with the exact same facts, okay? And both of them have their preordained belief bias, certain things that they just grew up with, certain things that their cultural circle uh, group thinks about as well. Basically, it, it does take an exceptional person to overcome their belief bias, okay? So few people leave religion as an adult who came from a religious upbringing, as do few people turn to religion as an adult who came from an atheist upbringing okay and the prism of religion is complicated but that's pretty clear evidence that the belief bias is strong you know there would be a random correlation there if belief bias didn't exist you'd have the same amount of people assuming one of them neither of them is necessarily true but you'd have the same amount of people going from raising christians going to atheists as you would raising atheists going to christian most people are unwilling to accept evidence that contradicts their belief Alrighty, number six the network effect our prop is a, a Soviet flask, the network effect. Each additional user that joins the network adds a marginal value to every existing user already in that network. Okay, does that sound familiar to you? Facebook is actually only as good as its network. The value of Facebook is not in its algorithm or its software or its products or its features or its memes. Facebook's value to the consumer, to you and me, is in the extensiveness of its network. Okay, and the Zuck admitted to as much claiming that speed of growth versus MySpace in the early days was the most important value to Facebook because the Zuck understood that the first social media platform to get the most users to hit this, at the time, arbitrary number, but high, this threshold number of users where the network effect was such that even if it was an inferior product, the other product became uh, redundant. Think back to when only half of your friends were on Facebook. Each, or at least I can remember this as a child from the early 90s, maybe uh, people beyond that can't really, but there was a time when Bebo, MySpace and Facebook were uh, legitimately competing against each other. But think back to when only half your friends were on Facebook. Each time one additional friend joined, the value of Facebook for you increased. Okay, so this is the network effect. It's a powerful concept that is a ubiquitous goal for all technology startups. I'll just hammer that point home. If you're on Facebook and 10 of your friends are on Facebook and 10 of your friends are on MySpace, the platform that you would end up using is probably based on whichever one of those people you wanted to speak to the most. If 18 of your normal friends were on MySpace, but two of your best friends are on Facebook, you'd probably still irk towards MySpace. Okay, the point is, is that the network effect is such that each additional user adds value to you. Okay, so I'll give another example. Uh, the telephone. The telephone is a classic case of the network effect. There is not much use having a phone if you're the only one. It could be the most sophisticated, remarkable phone in history, but there is no use in having it if you're the only one. But what if five people had them? Sure, there's more of an incentive to get one, but it's still a product for of, of, of opulence. You're unlikely to get it. What about 10? Eh, increasing your value a little bit for me but still not adding too much value. But what if everyone you knew had a telephone? Well, now the telephone is invaluable and the power, and that is the power of the network effect. The fundamental technology didn't change at all. The product didn't change at all, but more people were using it now and therefore it exponentially increased the value of the product. It's an interesting one, the network effect. Okay, number seven, this is the Peter principle and our uh, prop for today's video is my uh, Che Guevara money box. Number seven, the Peter Principle. This principle affirms my ceaseless criticism of bureaucracies, okay? This is perhaps the only thing that Nassim Taleb would ever acknowledge me for. You might've seen that I've made about seven videos on Nassim Taleb and a part of his work is such that he absolutely despises and criticizes people that sort of talk about his work. Um, he really looks down on the summary or the review or anything like that. He believes that if something is worthwhile, it will be read in its entirety. In slow dying hierarchies, such as big business or big government, people will be promoted until their competence threshold is met. And at this point, once the threshold is met, they will not be good enough to justify further promotion. They will remain where they are in mediocrity. 
So despite the fact that they had to show a certain level of value to get to that point, there is a no longer a, there is no longer a sign of marginal improvement, which means they've plateaued, which implies mediocrity. If you're not growing, you're dying. So as a result, the bureaucracies that move and shape the world are actually filled with individuals who are just not that good at their jobs. And anyone who's worked in a firm of more than 200 people or so will absolutely be able to affirm this. The Peter Principle explains so many inefficiencies and also how unlikely big government conspiracies are because with this much incompetence, someone would have been bound to speak. Okay, and that was the final concept. Thank you so much for watching the video. This was actually a uh, shorter clip taken out of a much longer video, which you'll be able to find on my channel where there's six subheadings in total. And in, all, in total, 31 concepts. So if you enjoyed this, if you managed to make it to the end, first of all, you're a ledge. Cheers. Uh, you, you know, if you liked one of the props, please leave it as a comment. Please like the video. Please subscribe. Leave five stars and have a look at the other, the other videos as well because there might be something interesting in there for you. I'm going to be making more content, so subscribing is probably the most important one. Click the bell as well. Who knows? Let's hack YouTube algorithm. Just go nuts, spam my stuff. Thank you so much for watching.